So as we were looking at last week, we, we saw that Jesus was there with the disciples. Um, this is that last time, the last really few hours of his life. And, and there he is with the disciples and he's pouring into them and he's loving on them. And he brings up this element of washing their feet. And, and, and I love the Lord's heart in this because, you know, here he is. He has a desire. We see such humility. This is God himself come down in human flesh. And what is his desire to do? It's to wash feet. He's, he's really taking on that role of a servant. We have a, a humble servant king. Mark 10, 45 tells us that the son of man did not come to be served, but what? To serve and to give his, his life a ransom for many. And I just love Jesus' heart here. And what does he want to do? He wants to wash their feet. He, he wants to... Uh, show them not just what it means to serve, but what it is that he is doing for them. And it's interesting because Peter's response was like, Lord, are you washing my feet? And he says, what I am doing, you don't understand now, but you will know after this. And Peter's like, you shall never wash my feet. He thought, God, you are too great. I believe who you are. Remember, Peter had confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And here, the son of God was going to wash his feet. He's like, no way. I can't let that happen. But look at Jesus' response. He's like, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Jesus is like, listen, there's an issue there. And we're going to deal with that issue. You're going to be washed clean. You're going to be made white as snow. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord, that though your sin is like scarlet, he says, I will make you what? White as snow. So Jesus was like, man, we need to, we need to it's time that you be washed, Peter. But then Simon, just in his, this guy was all hard and no brain, I think sometimes, you know? I feel like I can relate to that guy. But he says this, he's like, he, he says, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. And Lord's like, he's like, wash all of me. And he's like, no, wait, hold on a second. <laughs> he says, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Now, but not all of you refers to who is Judas Iscariot, who's there in his presence. But he's like, you guys are clean. And so we pick up here in verse 13. Jesus says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And so Jesus brings up a very interesting aspect he calls himself teacher and Lord. And he says, listen, you say this about me and I am teacher and I am Lord. But it begs the question, what do you say? Remember, Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? Is Jesus your teacher? More importantly, is Jesus your Lord? Many people called him Rabboni. Many people called him teacher but not all will call him Lord. A lot of people want Jesus to be their savior. They don't want to go to hell. They want to be saved from eternal punishment. They want to be saved from eternal separation from God. They want to be with him. The problem, though, is that while they call him um, their savior, they do not make him their Lord. And I just, I think it's such an important point for us to grasp tonight. Is Jesus your teacher? Listen, it's, it's not me, it's not Brian, it's not Ryan or Carlos or Rick or any of the other amazing pastors that we have on staff. It's, it's not them. It's God. It's, it's the Holy Spirit who teaches through us. Jesus Christ is the word of God. And so when we teach the word, it's God teaching. But have we made him our Lord? 
you know, there's going to come a point in time when, when people are going to come to Jesus, they're going to stand before him, and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, open unto me. And they're going to address him as Lord, because especially in that moment, when, they're, when they're, they're there standing before the throne of God, and they're going to cry out to him, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, wait a second, I don't know you. And they're going to be like, but wait a second, we cast out demons in your name. We prophesied in your name. We did these great things in your name. And he's going to say, listen, hold on. I never knew you. Be gone, you doers of iniquity, you, those who practice lawlessness. In other words, you had this religion, you had this form of godliness, but you denied the very power of God working in your life. You see, Jesus is, is clearing the way. His act of humility is clearing the way for us to come to him. But the only way that we can come to him is in true humility. The only way that we can approach him is in the righteousness that he offers to us because we of ourselves have no place in, uh, with him apart from him. No one will ever make it on their own. And Jesus is saying this, listen, he says, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. In other words, in this, with the same humility that I am serving you, you must also serve one another in humility. I believe that as time goes on, as this world continues just to spin out of control, as I begin, as I begin to think about how man is trying to become the, the, the ultimate authority, here's what I realize. I realize that we need the humility of Christ more than ever before. Remember, it's... it's God doesn't lord over us. In fact, guys, don't you remember that it's God's kindness. It's God's mercy. It's God's grace. It's, it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. His, his mercy that he offers us. His love that never fails. His grace that abounds over our sin, the very humility of God our Savior draws us in to him. And listen, if we then take that same humility, that same grace, that same mercy, that same love, and we allow Christ to live that through us to a lost and dying world, that's who they're going to be attracted to. They're going to be attracted to Jesus in you. And he's, he's bringing up that in the same way that I am here with you here tonight, in the same way that I am serving you right here, right now, you also ought to serve one another. Why? He says in verse 15, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. What greater example do we need to look at than Jesus? There's no one greater. You, you, you don't, don't look at my life. <laughs> you, you can't look at me. You can't look at Brian. You can't look at pastors. You can't look at man. Paul says, follow me. But how does he say follow me? As I follow Christ. Don't, don't look at me. If you look at me, you're going to find plenty to criticize. I mean, if we're being transparent here, there is plenty of stuff for you to point out. But the, the, the goal is not to follow one another. The goal is not to, I don't set an example for you. I set the example that Christ has set for me. And so merely all I'm going to do is I'm going to point you to him. Oh, Jesus, yeah, he's, he's right here. Come on, I'm heading that way. Come with me. Jesus says, as I have done for you, you also do for one another. I, I think of this setting as such a, a quiet and intimate time. 
And, and if Jesus is laying out these final instructions, he knows what's going to happen. He knows that not long from that moment, he's going to be delivered over into the hands of men who are going to uh, torture him, shame him, and ultimately crucify him. And so he doesn't teach them how to go out and rebel and fight. He teaches them how to humble themselves under the mighty hand of God that he would lift them up in due time. And this world needs that heart right now. This country needs that heart right now. And if we look at the life of Jesus, if we look at, at all the different things that he set an example for us to say and do, Listen, that is what makes an eternal impact in the lives of people today. Would you agree with that? It's, it's, it's not what I say. It's not what I do. It's what Christ says through me. It's what Christ does through me that people see value in. Because the work that God's doing in me and through me, the work that he's doing in you and through you, that is what bears eternal value. We're not living for this earth, right? What we're living to do is to glorify God. He's going to get to a new commandment here in just a little bit, but, but he's, he's talking about going deeper, guys. He's talking about getting out, out, out of the shadows. He's talking about coming in to the light. He's talking about going deeper. He's talking about getting to a place where it's just you and Jesus. Because... He's all that we need. And I want to encourage us tonight to get into that place where we're being that example because he says, most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent them. If you know these things, blessed are you if you what? If you do them. A servant is not greater than his master. And what I love about this is that we always see Jesus prefer the Father. We always see Jesus honor the Father. And so he has set the example for us. And we are to follow after him. Because listen, we're not greater than Jesus, are we? <laughs> I think that one's an easy one to answer. We're not. But I love what he says here. He says, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent them. Maybe that's a word for someone here tonight. Maybe just having George and Itsu come up and just talk about Hungary and their needs and, and the fact that, he's, that, that they're asking for laborers. <laughs> I don't know. Just thinking about it. Maybe God's calling you out. Maybe God wants you to take that mission trip to uh, Hungary. I don't know. But he says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. It's one thing, guys, for us to sit in here and to hear a message and feel good about it and like, wow, Lord, you really spoke to my heart. It's one thing for you to receive. It's another thing for you to do. Listen, the rhythm of heaven is as you receive, therefore you give. What God gives you, you give away. Freely you receive, so freely you give. We're not just to be hearers of God's word. They call the Dead Sea the Dead Sea for a reason because it has plenty of inlet, but there's no what? There's no outlet. It just sits there and it stagnates. Oh yeah, it's cool when you're sitting there and you're floating, you know? Somebody tries to push you down and you just bob right back up to the top. That's fun. But in a practical Christian life, listen, we're not made to be a bunch of dead seas. Jesus says, I will give you what? Living water, not stagnate water. Torrents of living water is meant to come up out of this life. Blessed are you if you know these things and you do them. James, that's what he tells us, right? Faith without works is what? It's dead. We don't work for salvation. We work from salvation. It's important that we remember 
that, that we need to be doers of God's word, not hearers only. Listen, we can, as Christians, become fat and lazy just sitting in a church listening to messages all day. It's great. I'm grateful George actually has a time tonight and, and on this trip where he doesn't have to teach. He can just sit at the Lord's feet. He can just sit and receive because he's given out. I've been with him. <laughs> they're given out all the time. And they're going from city to city. And it's not like a hop, skip, and a jump away. There's time involved. There's planning involved. There's lives in this city. There's lives in that city. It, it's, listen, blessed are you if you do them. Do what? Washing feet, serving others. The joy of the Lord is our strength. As much as you give out of the Lord, God's going to give to you overflowing. Listen, we want to be people who live out of the overflow of what God's doing. Amen? You don't want to be that Mississippi mud. You guys know what Mississippi mud is? That's that coffee that's been sitting at the very bottom of the coffee pot, a coffee pot that's been on there too long, and you go to pour it out, it's kind of like that tar, like sludge, right? It's like, oh, that's foul. You don't want to be part of that. Listen, you don't want to be Mississippi mud. You want your life to be living out of the overflow of what God's doing. And this is what he's talking about. Blessed are you if you do them. And I want to encourage us tonight to be those men and women who do those things. He says, I do not speak concerning all of you. Now, this is where he starts to make a distinction. He says, I know whom I have chosen out of that scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Now Jesus is making a very clear point here about who? About Judas Iscariot. Now, what's interesting here is we see that um, he, he quotes this. And he says, uh, he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now, what I find interesting uh, about this here is this is clearly a, uh, sorry, can't read here. <laughs> this is uh, clearly a, a reference to Psalm 41.9. And when David wrote this, we, we believe that he wrote this about who? About Ahithophel. Now, if you don't know the story, Ahithophel was a very trusted, close companion of David. He was an advisor who, who uh, he was in close counsel together. And when his son, David's son Absalom, came along and he rebelled against his father, guess what this guy did? This guy betrayed David and went over to who he thought would be the winning side. He was pursuing not, uh, he wasn't working for David's kingdom. He was working to save his own neck. And you can see how Jesus would quote this psalm here because isn't that exactly what Judas is doing? He's preserving his own life. Jesus said, hey, listen, if you want to save your life, you've got to do what? You've got to lose your life. To the one who loses his life, it will be saved. But he wasn't living for the kingdom that Jesus was talking about. He wasn't living for the kingdom of God. No, listen, he was living for his own things. To him, the kingdom of God was something that was tangible to him down here in this horizontal place. For him, he was kind of the, he was the treasurer. And so he kept the money. You knew that money was his God. And here, here's Judas. We'll get into a little bit of this later on, especially as, as John goes along. But really, Judas must have thought, man, this is the man. And guess what's going to happen with a man? He's going to raise up men to be in his inner circle. And I'm going to have wealth. I'm going to have influence. I'm going to have power. See, these were the things that Judas was, was living for. These were the things that were of value to him. But Jesus made it clear, my kingdom is not of this, what, earth. It's not of this earth. He says, now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. They're in the very midst right now 
of Scripture being fulfilled. You see, Jesus knows what's going to happen, and he knows who's going to betray him. But that doesn't mean that that's what he desires. How do we know that? Well, it's interesting. Look at verse 21. He says, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit. Look at that. It troubled him to say these words. Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. It troubled Jesus greatly that Judas was going to betray him. We're going to see later on when Jesus brings the guards to come and Um, take Jesus by force. Jesus looks at him and he doesn't say, everybody run for themselves. Judas, it's you and me. Let's square off. No. Jesus looks at Judas and he says, friend. Let that sink in for a minute. Even though he would go to betray him for 30 pieces of silver, Jesus still looked at him and he called him friend. Jesus was greatly troubled at what he knew Judas was going to go do. But I believe, I believe that he was reaching out to Judas even in that moment where they're at the table, even in that moment when he was there to betray him. I think if Judas would have said, Lord, I'm so sorry, I've betrayed you. Forgive me. I think we would be writing a different story about Judas today. We'd be having a different conversation. I think Jesus instantly would have forgiven him. But it wasn't to be. The disciples looked around at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was, there was, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. And Simon Peter mentioned, therefore mentioned to him to ask him who it was whom he spoke. And so here we see that they were all looking around like, what? Somebody is going to betray you, Lord? They're looking at the table. They're looking around, wondering who it might be. Now, let me just paint the picture for you. The table wasn't like a round table that we would see here today. The table would be in the shape of a U. And everybody would be um, at their place around the table, their, their feet kind of like uh, laying out, leaning back and maybe against some pillows. It would have been a very relaxed, very intimate setting. But there you would have Jesus there in the very midst of them. On the, on the uh, left hand, uh, on the right hand, you would have who? You would have John. And on the left side, you would have Judas. You see, that side there was for who? It was for the one who was in place. It was the place of honor. It was the one who was being honored. Judas was in the place where he was being honored right there by Jesus. It makes the story all that more compelling, doesn't it? It makes the, the hurt sting that much more. So when you know that it troubled Jesus to say that one of you is going to betray me, knowing that the person that was right there next to him would be the one, the very one that they had set in that place of honor. And that's why the, the disciples had a hard time believing it was Judas but he, look, at, look at what he says. Jesus says, uh, or he says there in verse 25, then leaning back on Jesus' breast, then he said to him, Lord, who is it? So John leans back and he's like, hey, Jesus, who is it? They all wanted to know. And Peter's like, dude, you ask him. He's like, oh, okay. And so he asks him, hey, who is it? They all wanted to know. But Jesus answered and said, it is to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, what's interesting when you read about this in the King James, he calls it a sop. Now, this sop was really this. It was, it was an act of love. 
He, he, here's Jesus. He takes this and he gives this to him. He wasn't just like, oh, let me grab a piece of bread and give it to the, to the guy. No, listen, it was, it was really him reaching out to Judas and he gave it to him. You don't hear anything from Judas, do you? Not right then and there. Now the piece of bread, now after the piece of bread, it says what? That Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Boy, what a heartbreaking story, right? He's like, hey, here you go. Here's your shot. You don't have to, you don't have to do this. This is me telling you, I love you. Jesus, the Bible says, is what? He is the bread of life. And there he is. He's like, here I am. He's giving Judas one more opportunity. Man, I don't know how many opportunities Jesus must have given me. I try sometimes to think about how many times the gospel was preached to me and how many times I rejected it and how many times I should have just flat out died. But God was long suffering towards me. He just kept coming after me and coming after me and coming after me. And I'm so grateful that one day my ears were opened to hear. And I remember when Brian preached it, I remember like it was yesterday. I felt like God was speaking to me alone. And he was like, Dale, it's time for you to deal with this issue. There is sin that is keeping you from me and me from you. And you need to deal with that issue. And I, I, I feel for the very first time that I heard his voice and I was just ready to respond to it. God brought me to that place where I knew that I had no other recourse, that he was my only hope and he was offering it for me right there. And I wasn't about to go another day, another moment without turning to him. I'm so grateful that he was long suffering towards me. And I'm thankful for that opportunity that he gave Judas right there. But no, just like Pharaoh, Judas what? He hardened his heart against God. You see, he believed that Jesus was there, but he didn't believe Jesus. It's one thing for us to believe that God exists. It's a whole other thing for us to believe him. And so Judas, Satan, entered him at that moment, and Jesus looked at him and said, hey, what you're going to do, do it quickly. In other words, you have your business to go, go do it. Because this would be that time when darkness would enter and soon Jesus would be betrayed into the hands of men. But know this, but no one at the table knew for what reason he had said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he went out immediately and it was night. Man, crazy because <laughs> everybody thought the best about Judas. It just goes to show that you can have a form of godliness, but you can deny the very power of God working in your life. You can be that close and still be an eternity away. The Bible says to make your calling and your election sure. How do we do that? Well, listen to this. Verse 31, so when he had gone out, Jesus said, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, why I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also one another by all this, uh, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so Jesus gets to the point of this whole thing. He says this, he says, now the son of man is glorified. So many times things would happen and Jesus could in that moment, he could have, he could have done something to prove who he was, but his hour had not yet come. And now he's saying this, now 
the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. This is hard. Because what did it take for Jesus to be glorified? His life. Let me just say this. If you ever wonder about how God feels about you, if you ever wonder about the life that he has planned for you, know this, you look to the cross. God's glorified because he sent his one and only son into the world that he would be crucified, that he would raise again from the dead, that he would bring many sons to glory. All that he had done for those, these last three years led up to this one moment, that from that moment moving forward, it would be about the glory of Jesus being revealed through his death. Guys, the way up is down. Remember, there's that, there, there's that scene there with, with Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Judas and, and, and the men come to, to take him. And Peter pulls out his sword and he's like going hack city. And he's like, whoosh, and he slice off the high priest servant's ear, right? And Jesus is like, whoa, put that thing away, man. What are you doing? Reach down, picks up the ear and heals the servant. He's like, listen, if, if, I, if, if I wanted to, let's be honest, I, I could call 12 legions to come down here and defend me. Jesus himself, when they asked him, hey, he's like, hey, who are you looking for? And they're like, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am. And they all go flying backwards. Even just that was enough. You see, he's glorified through his death, guys. But know this. We too also have to come to that place where we die. We die to ourselves. We come to that place of the cross. And we live for him. He lived the life that we should have lived. And then he died the death that we deserve to die. And so in response to that, he is lifted up and he is glorified. I love Philippians 2. He says that the name of Jesus Every knee will bow and every tongue will what? Confess. What are they going to confess? That he is Lord. You don't have to worry about that. Jesus is glorified. <laughs> but there's going to day, come a day when, when all of that is part of this. He says, little children, I shall be with you no longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now... I, um, I say to you, so he's telling them, listen, what about, what, what's about to happen? You can't partake in. I have to do this work alone. It's not going to be God plus man that saves. It's God and God alone who saves. Oh, and by the way, you guys are going to scatter. He gets to that at the end of this chapter, right? Peter's like, no way, not going to happen. He's like, listen, man, you're going to betray me three times. <laughs> But this is a work that God and God alone must do. Jesus must do this. But he tells them, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Now listen, that might sound like, oh, that's, that's interesting though. We, we already understand, right? Jesus, you said that, that what is the greatest commandment? We're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. It's the greatest. Yeah, we already know that. But look at what he added to the end of that there. He says, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So he's not saying, I want you to love them and to love me the way that you can, because you of yourself cannot do it. But as I have loved you. That's how we're to love, guys. We're to love the way Jesus loves. We're to love wholly and completely. We're to love sacrificially even. <laughs> We're to prefer one another, how? In love. <laughs> As Jesus laid down his life for his friends, so we too must also be ready to what? Lay down our life. For me to live as Christ, 
But to die is what? It's gain. Jesus says, this is how you're to love one another. And here's the result of that. The result is that as you love one another in the way that I have loved you, this world will know that you are my disciples. How how do you want people to know Jesus? By the way that we love one another. Remember, guys, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against a spiritual host of wickedness. People are not your enemy. They're lost. They're lost. They're wandering around in the dark. Of course they can't see. They're ignorant to God. So of course they don't know. And the same compassion that God had towards you before you came to him, you have that compassion towards one another. And I promise you, by the way that you love them, they will know that you are a disciple of Jesus. That's his word, not mine. So love one another in the way that Christ has loved you. And then Peter's like, hey, Lord, where are you going? Jesus says, where I am going, you cannot follow me now. I love that part. That gives me hope. But you shall follow me afterward. What is he saying here? He's like, listen, the life that I'm living out right now, the life that I'm living um, as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Father, you too, Peter, are going to live that life. And later on in the book of Acts, we, 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 we see that. Peter lives out a life. There he is sitting there and he's in the jail cell. And he should have been freaking out because James had already been beheaded. But there's Peter. Just what? He's just chilling. He's resting. Why? Because either way, he's good. He knew the life that, that Jesus had called him to. Do you know the life that Christ has called you to? He says, where I'm going, you can't follow me right now. But he's like, why can't I follow you? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, will you lay down your life for my sake? In other words, I I almost think like with my kids, right? They're like, daddy, don't worry, I'll do whatever. And I just look at them and I'm like, man... You're just a little kid. (laughs) You know, I remember my little ones, you know. They had the best intentions. The spirit is willing, but what? The flesh is weak. You know, and I just kind of want to pat them on the head and go, oh, thanks. I appreciate your heart. That's that's good on you, right? But you know that they're going to fail. And I think Jesus is just telling Peter, hey, listen. You know what? (laughs) Are you going to lay down your life for me? He's like, hey, let me just make sure that we're clear. He says, by the time that that this rooster uh, crows, you will have denied me three times. Now, what we don't see is this. Later on, Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. He says, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And basically, he says, when I restore you, I want you to go do this. I want you to go back and strengthen your brethren. In other words, he's not saying you're not going to fall, Peter. You're not going to mess up. He's saying, he says, listen, because I know you're going to mess up, the righteous man falls seven times and he what? He gets back up again. So when you get back up, Peter, here's what I want you to go do. I want you to go strengthen your brethren. That's the life that Jesus was calling Peter to. Peter had the right heart. But where the, the spirit is willing, the flesh can be weak. And so tonight, guys, as we close up, here, here's just what I want to say. I want to say, remember that Jesus has, has washed you. He sanctified you. He set you apart from this world. And he's given you a life of hope in his son. And if you will turn to him and allow him to lead you in this life, if you will be doers of God, God's word and not hearers only, you're going to be blessed by it. Oh, and by the way, the work that God does through you in those things, it's going to reach other people. And so I want to encourage us tonight, listen, be in that place, that good place that Mary was at. Martha was freaking out because Mary was just sitting where? At the Lord's feet. Guys, listen, Jesus is like, I'm not going to take that away from her. 
Jesus is calling us in tonight to that intimate relationship with him. Amen? I'm going to ask the guys in the band to come on up and uh, I'm going to close out with some worship here tonight. Let's pray.